Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Friday SLO talk. Um, well, I'm just so very happy to be here with you this morning. We have a very, very exciting uh, lineup of, 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 of topics uh, prepared for you. Um, I am joined here. Oh, my name is Yarek Yanyo. I'm from Santana College. And I am joined by my uh, coaches colleagues from uh, colleges in, in, in Southern California. If you could guys please introduce yourself would be great. And then we'll move on to Bill Mosley to talk about Badger. Amanda, please. Hi, I am Amanda Tinter. I am the Outcomes Coordinator and Instructional Design Coordinator at Reedley College in the Central Valley of California. Enrique. Hi, uh, my name is Enrique Jauregui. I am the SLO coordinator for Fresno City College, and I'm also located in the Central California, sister of Reilly College. Welcome. All right, good morning, welcome, and Grace. Good morning, everyone. My name is Grace Estrada. I'm the SLO coordinator and psychology faculty at Evergreen Valley College in San Jose, California. Thank you so much. So uh, we together, we are going to moderate the discussion. So please, if you have any questions, send us a message via chat, raise your hand, start speaking, anything's okay, just please wait for this natural break in the conversation. We'll be happy to entertain your questions and, uh, and suggestions, comments of, of, of any kind. And without any further ado, uh, here's uh, Bill Mosley, Vice, Prince, uh, Vice President at uh, Bakersfield City College. Uh, please, Bill, the, the, the floor is yours. Welcome, thank you again for joining us. Thanks, Yarek, and, and thanks everybody uh, for allowing me to come back and sort of update all of you on some of the things that are developing out in the world of, of micro credentials. And uh, I, I'm gonna speak specifically today on the connection, uh, the functional connection between micro credentials and, and your work and your interest in assessment and bringing assessment into the forefront of, of the work that we do in education. And so, I think there's some really strong connections there. And also if you've been paying attention out there in the world um, of educational technology, you might have heard that uh, Instructure, the parent company of Canvas, recently purchased uh, a company called Concentric Sky, which is the parent company of Badger, which is the leading micro-credential issuing platform. So. We're, we are, if, if I'm reading the signals correctly, and I, I think I am, we're about to see some pretty large scale integration of badging into instruction. So getting ahead of that, uh, I think is a very good idea uh, for us as California Community Colleges. In fact, I'm working with a small group of California Community College districts uh, to expand the work that I'm doing at Bakersfield College with my team uh, to some of those uh, districts as well in, a, in a, an expanded pilot. So um, with, without any further delay, let me launch into this. And uh, I just wanna say, uh, I'm a pretty informal guy. So if, if you have questions and, I, and this is a small enough venue, I, 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 I'm happy to entertain those right in the flow of things. Once I get going down the track, I'm, I, I have I kind of have a lot of momentum, but I'm happy to if you can if you can get a word in edgewise, I would say go for it, and I'm happy to um, take side trails as as time allows us to. Um, and I'll just do my best to get through the slides with with some time for questions at the end. Yark, I think I have an hour total, right? You certainly do. Actually, I, I'm I'm down to 54 minutes already, so <laughs> I, I I better get moving. Um, you're fine, you're fine. <laughs> okay, so uh, I'm going to sort of present to you a model here that I kind of call learning with wheels. And uh, this isn't really about the automotive industry, as exciting as that is. Um, it's really about providing some mobility to, to the things that we give students in higher education. And uh, some of you have heard some of some of my talks on this before. So for some of you, this is a review, but I, I just want to sort of start at, at square one uh, by criticizing a little bit what we currently do in education. And I promise I will connect this back with assessment very soon. But uh, this is this is a fairly standard transcript. Uh, if you've served on hiring committees, you've been in education for a while. 
You've probably seen plenty of these and they all sort of look the same. Uh, I don't know. I don't know what the design aesthetic is uh, that they have to look like they come out of a typewriter uh, for them to be official. Uh, but they they all seem to for some reason. Uh, and this is this is a transcript for a graduate program. Uh, but it's it's got some of the same things that we would expect on it, right? So this is this is where we currently are in education. We have a, a transcript that says here's the degree you received, here are the classes you took, how many units they were, the grade, the title some weird abbreviation of the course title that you have to, it's sort of like trying to figure out what a personalized license plate says, where you have to insert some vowels and do some guessing. Um, and you know, the, the total number of units that were taken, the, the final GPA and, and the all important, completely unforgeable stamp of, of, of officialness from the institution, right? Uh, I say that in jest because, um, you know, that's the, the embossed transcript is the highest standard of, of information security that we have in the, in the official business. Uh, of course, we now have a, a, a way to transmit uh, transcripts um, electronically, but the electronic transcripts are every bit as useless as, as this one is. I mean, really, what can you learn? about somebody's education by looking at this. I would argue very, very little, almost nothing. In fact, you, you can kind of get an idea of what they might have learned if you, had, if you do a lot of guesswork. So, um, so really, like, what, what are we trying to do with these institution-owned, not portable, not meaningful, not flexible transcripts that, oh, by the way, have no assessment? What are we even doing right now, right? Uh, here's everything that the ACCJC says about grades and units in the accreditation standard. Everything. Units of credit are awarded with institutional policies that reflect generally accepted norms or equivalencies in higher education. If the institution offers courses based on clock hours, it fo follows federal standards for clock to credit hour conversions. That's everything it says about both grades and units. Notice that the ACCJC does not even use the word grades in the accreditation standard. Now let's look at what the ACCJC says about assessment and outcomes. You'll notice it's slightly more significant. By the way, this isn't every single occurrence. These are just more of them. But I want you to note that the things that I've, that I've put in red here the, the institution regularly addresses, re regularly assesses learning outcomes. Uh, students receive a course syllabus that includes learning outcomes. Have you ever wondered why? Why would they have us do that? The student, do, do we ever tell the student how they did on those learning outcomes? We don't, typically at Bakersfield College. Uh, and number nine is my favorite. This is word for word what this, the accreditation standard says, the institution awards course credit, degrees and certificates based on the grade they received in the class. Uh, oh, wait, nope. It's based on student attainment of learning outcomes. Raise your hand if your institution uses the attainment of learning outcomes for the awarding of course and degree credit. Same. Same, we don't either. So what are, what are we even doing? Um, now I know, I'm sure some of you are like, well, Title V says that you have to give a grade. That's true. Martin, are you, are you raising your hand for, for the answer for number nine? Are you one of those golden institutions that actually uses assessment or do you have a question? Not really, I think it was in between. So we're not aware of it either, so. You're right. Maybe it's not true at all. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, uh, so T Title Five does does, by the way, mention both grades and credit hours. Sorry, California Ed, ed Code does say give grades, but it also says institutions may, in in situations where where the point of the course is mastery of the subject matter, just say the student mastered the subject matter and give them credit. Did you know that? We don't have to, we, we absolutely do not have to give grades. 
And I would argue that maybe we need to think about not giving grades, but maybe that's a different talk. Um, so we, we have it for transferring articulation. It, it makes a connection between assessment and general education approval based on outcomes. Uh, and of course, student support. So all over the accreditation standards, we see this student learning outcomes and assessment conceptually and, and directly called out using those words. So here's the problem. Grades are bad. We could argue this all day long, but, but I, I think I'm gonna win that one. Let's just pretend I did. Uh, grades are inequitable. We know that grades are, are not fair and they're not fairly applied and they don't impact certain student populations in the same way that they impact other student uh, populations, which means that's not a good thing. They're inadequate because they focus on performance across a longitudinal uh, swath of seat time that's measured by units. And they don't, they don't, they don't actually tell you mastery. They, we don't know if somebody's mastered a subject matter or a student learning outcome. Um, and, and they don't even exist in our accreditation standards as we know. ACCJC doesn't even know what grades are. Uh, units are just as bad, maybe worse. Units measure how long has the student sat in a seat and listened to somebody. That tells me less than nothing. Uh, you, you know that the Carnegie unit was originally developed as a way of um, A, seeing if a, a high school student had, had sat through enough lecture time to be qualified for higher education. And the second reason, you know what that Carnegie unit was for? Uh, quantifying fac uh, the amount of class material for the purpose of faculty pay. Just so you know, it wasn't about, it was never about learning. Um, assessment is, is great. Assessment is, is the most promising movement of all of these. But right now, a lot of, a lot of folks at a lot of institutions see assessment as this extra thing we have to do, right? Uh, it's disconnected from, from learning and instruction. It's sort of like a sidecar on a motorcycle. You can have it if you if you want it, but it's not really necessary for a motorcycle to have a sidecar. Uh, but but here we go. ACCJC says we have to have the sidecar. Uh, so students don't ever find out how they did on assessment in in many many cases. And if you're a really if you're really ahead of the game with assessment, you're assessing your students' learning outcomes and reflecting it back to them at the end of the class. So the current model looks something like this. We've got curriculum, which uh, by virtue of the accreditation standards must require student learning outcomes. So we use the curriculum for instruction and we use the SLOs for assessment. And after that point, uh, you know, we use the instruction to generate grades and units and feedback for students and assessment. We, uh, we of course do the assessment things, um, but there's this sort of barrier between the two. There's not a whole lot of communication. And we use, we use the results of assessment to inform our SLOs. We use it to inform our assessment practices. And if you're one of those really, really rare, really assessment attuned teachers, you've been paying attention enough and you know that the, the real hidden gem of assessment or the real purpose of assessment is to inform our instruction. But that's, maybe a minority, okay? But, but it is, that, that's the real power of, of assessment, right? Is, 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 is as a, a way of being mindful about our instruction and about how we do instruction. And so, um, you know, instruction is sort of the main course with grades and units and feedback and assessment is sort of relegated to this side dish that maybe a few people like, but you just sort of have it so that you can have, so you can say you had the side dish. Um, I don't know, maybe you like pea soup and I just insulted you, I'm sorry. Um, for a lot of folks, including our students, 
education is this sort of black box, right? Where we have students of all different types and colors and, and backgrounds and talents and, and goals, and they pass their education, they come out the other side and they're graduates. And what happened during those two years or those four years, if, if they get a bachelor's degree or my gosh, sometimes those 10 years, if they if you stick around long enough, right, Yarek? Uh, that that what happened during the, those time? Uh, what did they learn? What did they what did they get from that? And for the for a really long time, we've been sort of keeping education a, this mysterious black box, and we sort of say, well, we don't want transparency in education because we're afraid that maybe that's going to mess with our academic freedom, or maybe that's going to exposing the secrets of what happens in my class is. It, it, it opens me up as an instructor to criticism or a loss of freedom or maybe even um, evaluation that's not appropriate. And so it's kind of scary, but I think there's a way forward here. Uh, and, and here's something I, I've taken to saying lately. Um, if we think about skills, uh, we don't like to say skills outside of the CTE world, right? If you're a philosophy professor and I start talking about skills, you might get a little bit nervous. But a skill just means you can do something. And maybe doing something is critical thinking. Maybe doing something is being able to discuss the principles of philosophy. And, and so that's a skill. It's, it's just a, a learning a piece of learning with forward momentum. And so I, I like to say that skills are just learning with wheels, but for the purpose of this conversation, I'm gonna do a little bit of rebranding and I'm gonna say assessment and badges are just learning with wheels because that's really what I want to talk about. And uh, the model of a wheel is interesting uh, because it sort of, it sort of has components of connection to it. And I think what I want to do is paint a picture for you today of how we can connect our current practice to a better practice. Because everybody knows that if I start talking crazy talk, like let's just get rid of grades and let's get rid of Carnegie units because they're useless, everybody will say, look, Bill, that sounds nice, but there's no way that's going to happen. We don't even have anything to replace them with. So I'm not going to talk today about a revolution. I'm going to talk about a mindful evolution of our practice that includes the addition of or the layering of a better practice that's highly compatible with what we're doing right now because we know that we can't just get rid of Carnegie. We can't get, get rid of grades. We can slowly start to chip away at some of those things, but we've got to have something there that's ready to replace those things in the long term. And this, this evolution may take the rest of my life. It may take longer than that. Oh my gosh, Carnegie units were invented in 1906, right? And here we are 116 years later, still using Carnegie units, still using grades. They're severely outdated. In fact, the US Department of Education, 1954, published a study that said we should get rid of Carnegie units. Okay, 68 years later, here we are, right? So um, anyway, we've got right now, you can think of this as sort of the axle of the wheel, right? We've got this practice. We know it works to some extent. It's a functional system to some extent. I'm not saying it's a great system, but it's what, it's what we have. So what I'd like to propose is that we build something around that, a wheel perhaps, of, of modern effective learning practice that includes assessment. In fact, that focuses more on assessment and so the spokes of that wheel are some of the things that we can do now to connect our, our current work and our current practice with this better practice. And so, uh, and it's, it's really all of these connect with, with badging in some way. So we've got uh, educational planning. So we want students 
to think about their educational journey. I mean, the old adage of the student sitting in the in the algebra class and saying, okay, I just learned the Pythagorean theorem. When am I going to use that, right? The old adage of somebody sitting in a philosophy class and saying, well, why do I need to know about the, you know, the tro trolley car uh, problem, uh, right? So what it's, it's, it's really saying, okay, students, let's talk in a real way about what you're actually learning. What are the, what, and, and talk about your educational journey because it's not like you, you know nothing, 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 and then four years later you walk across the stage and all of a sudden you know some things. It's, it's that whole journey is important. And, and planning that journey and helping students understand what that, what that educational journey is like through educational planning, through mapping uh, of education uh, is, is important. And, and badges are a great way to articulate that. We need to, we, my gosh, uh, don't get me started on instruction. I could talk for years and years about how we need to change our instruction. Um, I'm just too excited about it. Uh, we need to change our student records. Uh, we can't get rid of transcripts yet, bad news. We still have to keep the useless piece of paper that's uh, institution owned, but we can, we can enhance our transcripts by putting a badged, a badge based transcript that includes skills and includes uh, that's digital and student owned, we can give that to them in addition. It's a value add to our current transcripting. So we can, we can alter that conversation. And that's what I'm talking about, connecting what we do now with this better model. Uh, we can provide them things that are more connective because we live in a connected society and they should be able to take something that they get from a college. Somebody graduates from BC with a badge, they should be able to turn around, take that badge, put it on LinkedIn and get a job. Or they should be able to take that badge, send it to a university and say, here's a class I took, give me credit for it at your university. Because that badge contains more detail. It's more connected and it's digital because we live in a digital world. We don't live in a world of paper and embossments and rubber stamps. We gotta have curriculum on board. Curriculum is the heart of what we do. It drives us forward. It is, it is, it's, it's essential to this process. And of course, assessment. And of course, today, given this group, assessment is where I want to really put some focus. So this is what we're looking at now with our current system of things. It's old, it's low res. You can't really see what it is. You could guess if you stand really far back and kind of squint your eyes and tilt your head a little bit to the side, you can guess at the high resolution image. But we have the digital capability to, to give people, to give students a high resolution image. So we should do that, right? And that's what I'm talking about. And, and the means of getting there is badges. And no, not these kind of badges, not the kind you have to sew on your clothes or your mom has to sew on your clothes, uh, although that would be cool. Uh, we're actually talking about these kind of badges, digital badges. Now, if you don't know what a digital badge is, let me sum it up for you. A digital badge is an image, just like this one. In fact, this is one of our image, our badge images <clears throat> for Bakersfield College. This is a, a an associate in science for transfer uh, in plant science degree level badge. And inside that badge, we have in a way that cannot be faked, cannot be forged, embedded data about what that badge means so that anybody who receives that badge can share it, can look at it, can see what, what that badge signifies. And so the data that's inside that badge includes who received it. So the student's name and identifying information, who issued it, Bakersfield College, when it was issued, Here's the assessment part, the criteria for the badge being earned. Can we say program learning outcomes? The link to the evidence. Can we say the assessment tool, right? <clears throat> Standards alignment. And not it, this could be any external standard. It could be a, a standard in the college. It could be an industry standard in some cases. It could be even 
a link to a CID or an, a, a transfer model curriculum. So there's a lot there, right? If we all, if we, if we, we already have transfer model curriculum at the, at the program level, we already have CIDs at the course level. If we all start linking our course and program level badges to those things, we have a fabulous level of curricular alignment across the system. And if you want, a badge could have an expiration date. So if you're giving badges for a certification that needs to be renewed every two years, you can actually expire those badges so that they so that they they need to be renewed. And all of that information is invisibly embedded into these images. Again, it can't be faked, it can't be forged. So, you know, I I'd say that rivals the embossed transcript any day. I put those two against each other any day of the week because the transcript doesn't even have a fraction of that information. And in fact, at Bakersfield College, we're actually embedding uh, program level outcomes in our program level badges and course student learning outcomes in our course level badges, along with skills. So when a student receives a badge, they can actually crack that open and say, this badge represents me learning these things and these skills. And they can take that badge, they can use it to apply for jobs, they can use it to search a job database for jobs that they're qualified for. And that's before they even are granted a degree. Because like I said, that, that journey is, is, is gradual. It's not uh, four years of nothing and then you graduate and all of a sudden you know things. So badges give us, and here's a course level badge for, for our Geography B3 class. <clears throat> um, they give us transparency of learning and assessment. Because now when a student receives a badge, those student learning outcomes are there. The assessment is there. The connection to the instructor is there, the date they earned it. All of that information is there. They own it, they have access to it. It, it gives us, it gets us, let me just back up to this one, one more thing. Um, it gives us a, an ability to move beyond that black box view of education by adding a, a very uh, useful level of transparency to our courses without impinging upon the faculty's ability to teach that class in a way that they want to teach that class. So it gives us the transparency without the fear of evaluation or the lack of uh, the loss of academic freedom. And I think that's really important. <clears throat> they are portable, they're digital, and the students own them. The student controls them. When they want to have proof that they completed a class or completed a program, using badges, they don't have to come to the college and pay us $12 for a copy of their own transcript that they already should own by virtue of the fact that they paid tuition and did the learning. I think that's a crime <laughs> that students have to pay for transcripts. I understand they have to stay in business, but it's, a, it's criminal, right? It's almost as bad as the tech book, textbook industry. Um, badges give us a higher resolution picture, like that picture of the flower. Uh, you know, we're not trying to decipher the personalized license plate names on, on a transcript anymore. We have very detailed information because we're not trying to cram a whole bunch of stuff onto one piece of paper anymore. We have, it's cyberspace. We have the ability to have all that information at our fingertips. And so we can. We've got better forward compatibility because badges are digital pieces of data. So we can use badges in the future in ways that we haven't even thought of yet. And that's exciting to me. And here's, here's the one I really, really love as a, as a, a former faculty member. Um, it's a foundation for a mastery oriented approach to teaching and learning. And I think that we've got to get there. And I think assessment, badging, competency-based learning, non-credit education, those, these are all things that are converging in a really cool way around mastery. Title V allows for mastery. ACCJC standards practically encourage it, right? We don't talk about grades, so why not? Of course they're assuming mastery if we're talking about assessment. So let me propose a new model. It looks a little bit like the old one, 
but with some significant differences. Let me hit them at a high level and then we'll go a little deeper. So first um, note that the curriculum now includes SLOs and badges. Cur curriculum's gotta, gotta help, help this out by becoming a vehicle for badges. Uh, instead Bill, of just, oh yeah, sure, go. We have a question in the check real quick. Um, so sure. Jacqueline asks, um, how do we set up our grading systems to recognize the different levels of mastery and award a badge sorry my scroll and award a badge upon achievement and isn't that determination of mastery in the end achieved attached to grades or at least a performance on objective items or rubric criterion so that was a couple of different questions and i don't know jacqueline if you want to unmute or add some clarification or if I, you I, that. I, I think i, I think i i think i've okay. got it i mean this we've had this question before. So if somebody gets a C in, in a class or on an assignment even, have they mastered it? Hypothetically, how many of you would say yes, a C, a C student has mastered something? I would say yes, in my personal opinion. You would say yes? And they're a if, master if, of, of that subject. If they say, if C is passing, and I'm saying that passing equals they've mastered the contact or mastered the, the skill, because mm -hmm. it's equating to, to what I'm saying as an instructor, if I'm passing them, then I am verifying that they've mastered the skill. Now, how many skills are in that class? That's the question. That is, that's a, it's a good question. And we, there's a lot, this is a, this is not a short conversation, a, a spoiler alert, okay? Yeah. Uh, I won't solve all of this problem for you right now, but I, I will ask some provocative uh, questions and, and just so, sort of start us thinking about this because it's a conversation that we need to have. Um, mastery isn't something in my mind that you can say, I sort of mastered this, which is sort of what a C is, right? Is I kind of mastered this. It really requires us to think about teaching and learning differently. Right now, we've got a very time-bound system of teaching and learning and a very time-bound idea. So, so my course outline, you know, is attached to a 16-week semester in which I have four exams and two projects and a paper and assigned, you know, two chapters a week of reading. And so I'm pushing students through that course and helping them to try and master that thing within two weeks or whatever that before the next exam so that they can do well on the exam so they can demonstrate mastery. I, I know not every class is taught that way, but it's sort of a common model, right? So what I'm suggesting is that maybe we need to rethink how we do education and how we do instruction and maybe, and maybe even, uh, brace yourself, I'm about to say something really scary, unbundle it from the time part of it. And maybe, maybe a student is struggling with something in particular. And so they, they submit a, a project or exam or whatever, and it, it's a C level effort or it's a D level effort. And we're, it's, a, it's, a, it's at a level, let's just say, without going into a grade, that we just say, no, this is this does not meet the threshold that I've established in this class for mastery of this subject, right? Sort of almost like we're doing assessment, right? Did did students pass this SLO? Are they did they master this thing? No, they did not. What's what's stopping me as an instructor from saying, well, let's let's figure out a way to help you master that. Let's give you another shot. Let's revise this paper. Let's redo this project. Um, and I, you know, uh, invariably I'll steer you away in this conversation from, from thinking about exams because I, I have some opinions about those two, but um, inherent in this is, is a shift away from 
a model that requires a rote memorization of things and a, a shift away from instruction that is centered around that an assessment that that uses that model of, of thinking uh, but but I, I guess what i'm saying is instruction and and that's why i have these circular arrows around the instruction and the embedded assessment in this model that you see here because i think there's room for iteration in our classroom even in a time-bound classroom there's some room for iteration and we could we could talk about that maybe in another seminar but i think there's room for us instructionally to say um to a student hey yeah you you really struggle with that last concept and i know as the instructor that the next concept builds on that so let's let's not push you forward because that's what's on my course outline let's hang out here a little bit not the whole class necessarily but let's here's some here's some extra things i'd like you to do or here's some things i'd like you to look into before you resubmit that paper and let's make sure you get that before we move on and i know there's a lot of you going but 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 at the end of the semester that student's going to be behind yeah maybe um but is it worth pushing them forward i mean is it worth pushing them forward through something they don't understand which is worse i don't know and, and i don't have all the answers to this I'll, I'll i'll admit that right now i don't have all the answers but I, I do have a lot of i think good questions that need to be explored and i'm comfortable just sort of sitting in that reality for a little bit because i think there there's value in exploring those questions enrique you had a question a while back and you, i just saw you on mute so what's 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 on your mind so thank you um bill you're talking about C. Please describe what a C minus or a C plus means. <laughs> to me, it, it may, reminds me of high school, to be honest. Um, <laughs> mostly the C minus. <laughs> C minus. Um, so that does, does, you know, and then does that matter in the field? Does it matter in the nursing? Does it matter in, in the philosophy, mathematics uh, uh, versus the bad versus the badging? You, you know, you have learned the skills and the competencies. Well, the what, what I would say is, you know, you could take three math faculty at the same college. And you could say, and this concept, what is a C minus to you? Versus a C plus, and you'd probably get different answers. Right. So we've got some norming to do. We've got some standardizing to do when it comes to like, what's a competency? in a subject matter what's a what's an acceptable level of not knowing if if we're talking about nursing or brain surgery <clears throat> i I'd, I'd rather not have a, a c minus brain surgeon operating on me right <clears throat> so i don't know i i would just like to say you know here's the level of mastery here's here this is what represents mastery in this discipline and not not even go to the grade. Let's just forget about that. Let's pretend like grades didn't exist and just say, what's the what's mastery for this concept? What does that represent? Being able to do that thing. And then we use that when you when you can do that thing at that level. Then we give you the badge because it represents mastery. And then we're then we're saying we're not really talking about C minus C plus. We're talking about are you good enough at drawing blood to be a phlebotomist that's right <clears throat> so that's 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 sort of the direction i'm headed and i think there's there's in, assessment and instruction should never ever ever be separated and, and we should not talk about them as though they're separate things but but we do because we've been doing grades for 150 years or more or whatever, hundreds of years. And assessment wasn't cool until the 70s, right? Or sometime around there. Assessment's new. It's this additional thing that we have to do. And I, I, don't, I can't speak for any college except for mine, but I know that the way assessment was introduced at Bakersfield College uh, about 20 years ago, um, sort of, created a context for assessment that said, this is an extra thing that we do. We, we do our teaching 
and we also have to do assessment. And I've actually heard union folks say that. I don't need assessment because I know when my students are, 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 are learning. I don't need to do assessment because I just know. And I'm like, you're, you must be a, a magically better than I am at, in, the, in the classroom because I, I don't know that I know my students at that level. I can't get in their head. Uh, I'm gonna carry on because I'm, I'm see that I, time is marching on, speaking of time bound. Um, sorry, I, I, we don't have time for mastery in this world, uh, but uh, let's just cruise on through here. Uh, so another uh, piece of this puzzle or piece of this new model <clears throat> is student iteration. I think students in the classroom, in instruction, need to be able to iterate. It has to be built into our instruction students need to be able to go back and and really figure stuff out we cannot have mastery without it prove me wrong um i would say faculty and we talk about this in assessment circles you're like of course because you're all assessment people right we talk about this in faculty circles we use assessment <clears throat> the results of our assessment to help us teach better right. faculty need to iterate uh in the in the uh in the dot-com industry, they call this eating your own dog food, right? Like you're you're practicing what you preach, basically. So if you're, you're, you're showing students how to iterate and you're using that iteration, and perhaps most importantly, you see the little arrows here connecting student iteration with faculty iteration. I'd love to see the transparency that happens when a faculty member allows students to see them iterating in their own instruction. I think that's the most powerful thing you can do as, a, as, a, as an instructor is, is say, I'm still learning. When we let our egos get in the way and we, we have to be the one with the answers, it, it cripples our instruction and it, it dehumanizes our teaching. So of course, the faculty iteration takes into account instruction takes into account curriculum, it feeds back into those areas. So let's dig a little deeper into, into the pieces of this model. And I, I wanna get to a, a, a overview of how we're implementing this stuff at BC, uh, just to give you a feel for it. So badges and curriculum, <clears throat> have, they have to be married, they have to be embedded, they have to be a part of the curriculum because otherwise you're gonna have things that are out of sync. Eventually your curriculum committee has to own badges. <clears throat> we just voted um, this this semester on on a procedure for our curriculum committee to begin to own badges as part of our curriculum. <clears throat> uh, assessment has to be integrated with instruction on a granular level. And yes, I am talking about the the dreaded every student, every SLO, every class. Why would we not? We we have to tell we don't <laughs> on our syllabus, we don't randomly choose one SLO to tell the students this year you're gonna learn about this thing. And some of you I will assess it. No, we tell them all of the SLOs. Why in the world are we not telling students how they did on those SLOs? That's practically criminal. Uh, you know, when ACCJC says you should use assessment to determine the awarding of degrees, the, the, the least we can do is tell students how they did. Uh, so this, the relationship between student iteration and mastery. <clears throat> a line from my favorite, one of my favorite movies, right? Um, so Jim Carrey says says to uh, this girl that he's interested in, what are the what are the odds that a girl like you would end up with a guy like me? And she says one in a million. And his response is, so you're telling me there's a chance. And I say that because I think that this is going to be a tough one for a lot of people. A lot of faculty are going to struggle with this. Why? Because it's complicated and it's a huge departure. Um, if you want to feel fired up about getting rid of grades, there's a book called Ungrading. 
I can't remember the author's name off the top of my head, but you read it and then let's have a conversation about it because uh, it's a great book. And I've got a, a few faculty colleagues, uh, Michelle Kikansky Brock, uh, Fabiola Torres from Glendale, uh, who are doing great work around ungrading and humanizing the classroom. It's, it goes hand in hand with this stuff in a, in a very beautiful, meaningful way. Uh, faculty iteration, uh, it, it sort of goes without saying, I don't have to, I'm gonna avoid preaching to the choir here. And then of course, de-siloing the instruction from the faculty iteration. I, again, that transparency is very powerful. So let's turn quickly in our last 13 minutes or 12 minutes and 20 seconds here to what's going on at Bakersfield College. I'm telling you, we got badges, people. We have created over 180 program badges and over 1,500 course level badges. They are currently being implemented uh, across our curriculum in every subject area for every course. Um, this is what we're building toward. We have program level badges in this picture. We have course level badges and you can see the black badges or the dark gray badges are actually student learning outcomes level badges. That's This is my long game, people. Uh, this is what I'm building toward. I want every SLO for every course at Bakersfield College to be not only badged, but assessed and awarded every semester for every student. It's gonna be a huge lift. We're talking about probably tens of thousands of badges by the time we get done. But we've already started with some of those ideas. Oh. So this is my holy grail, right? A badge that represents the SL, an SLO that includes how that SLO was assessed, who assessed it, when it was assessed, what institution, maybe even connects it with a CID. Enrique, question. Maybe just wants a high five. Uh, Bill? Yeah. Um, so you haven't uh, embedded or uh, the badging into the SLO? Uh, the the right now I I'll, I'll I'll get to that. Let me uh, okay. let me just carry on here. Um, so we've got um, I'm I'm going to talk about that with the implementation because we are connecting the assessment to the course level badges right now as a way of of getting us started down this road. And again, uh, Rome wasn't built in a day. But uh, our implementation is kind of a six six phase project with lots of sub steps there. Uh, the first step is to pilot badging. So we started out three years ago uh, piloting uh, with piloting badging in a few courses and a few programs. We started with CTE non credits a great way to go to because non credits already pass no pass. So, um, you know, and, and if you've got a CBE program, if you're working competency-based education, that's another great, great place for badges to enter the scene in a, in a, in a way. Uh, we worked with our marketing departments to develop a badge template for course program and SLO level badges so that we could scale that quickly and easily. Uh, we developed the process for creating those badges and always always we work with faculty right so we had faculty who we actually paid a stipend to participate in this pilot and help us develop some of these ideas the next phase when you're ready to move forward when you're ready to go beyond the pilot uh, is is to, to to talk with your committees and your governance folks the academic senate the curriculum committee the assessment committee all of those folks have to have to be so tired of hearing about badges that they're no longer surprised when Bill Mosley gets up in front and starts talking about badging. Um, uh, you need to you need to have your faculty chairs on board because there will be a, a lift from faculty and departments. And of course, your your records department cannot be surprised by this because you're actually uh, taking an, another transcript, so to speak, and and marrying it with the transcript they already issue. So you've got to think about your procedures for awarding those badges and that sort of thing. Creating the badges 
is a, is a pretty huge lift. We actually hired an external graphic designer to take the templates and we just fed them. Uh, we fed them a list of courses and programs and just said, Hey, here's what we want. Just crank them out. And so with the templates, they were able to make those 1500 badges uh, for courses and the, the 184 programs relatively quickly. And we'll, we'll go back to that. Well, when we get ready to start rolling out our uh, SLO level badges in the future. Uh, a badge issuing platform, uh, we use Badger. If you're a Canvas school, which I'm pretty sure most of you are, uh, I would recommend looking at Badger as, a, as an issuing platform because again, uh, Instructor now owns Badger. And so you, you're, gonna, you're going to see some very tight integration. If you're a school that uses the job speaker platform, they have badges as well. I would argue that that's not the way we wanna go for a lot of reasons. Um, also, Badger uh, subscribes to a, a standard of badging called Open Badges, which means that their badges that are issued through them are interoperable with any other product or platform that uses the Open Badging standard, and, and that's a big deal on the internet. Okay, that's sort of how things talk to each other. Um, we have married our badges with our program mapper. If you're Pathways Program Mapper School. Uh, that that platform is also developed by Concentric Sky, who is the parent company for Badger, who's owned by Instructure now. Um, and our Pathways Program Mapper has badges integrated. We're also working on integrating them with our electronic catalog. Okay, so we have a digital online catalog, but you can do it just as easily with paper. Uh, the, the point is, uh, we want to start getting people used to seeing badges in places and thinking about badges and thinking about skills. And so in the fall, we'll be coaching faculty, assisting them with using those badged images um, on their syllabi and also thinking about how they can communicate uh, SLO results back to students. So that, that's sort of the, the plans for the fall. Uh, and I said, start in the middle. We started, our, our big push is, is with course level badges. Um, while I know that the, the real value, the, um, the revolutionary piece of this is when we get down to the SLO level. If you start at the SLO level from day one, um, you will run out of steam mm -hmm. because people won't get it. It's too big of a leap. You, people understand a course. They understand that I passed a course and right now, Bakersfield College, because we still use grades, because we have to connect the wheel to the axle, right? Um, we're saying you get a course level badge if you pass that course with a grade that would make that course eligible for credit toward the awarding of a degree or certificate. So in some cases, it's a D, some cases it's a C, but that, that's what we're using right now. As we shift in the future someday, to a purely uh, mastery-based model, we'll be able to establish that level of mastery and say, this is the level of mastery. We don't even need to talk about grades anymore, but this is what represents mastery at that level. But we're not there yet. We have to connect, we have to connect what we're doing with what we want to do. And so it, 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 again, it's gonna take some time, uh, but I think this is the way to do it. So I think starting in the middle, with course level badges is really the way to go. Um, aligning skills. Uh, we actually have a platform uh, that was created uh, by a third party uh, that we use to make it really, really easy for faculty to check the skills that are awarded with each badge. So we use the SLOs and the objectives for each course to generate uh, some skills through the MC Job Skills database. And we, we put those skills on a website and faculty can come and see, uh, see the skills that are suggested by MZ based on the SLOs and objectives. So that's how we're connecting the assessment with that course at that level, at the skill level. Um, and the faculty have input. They say, well, you know, these th first three skills seem appropriate for this course, but this fourth one, I think we should change it this way or we should replace it with this other skill or just take it off altogether. And so faculty are validating the skills at the course level based on the SLOs and objectives of that course. And we know that right now, assessment doesn't drive everything that we do instructionally, 
but we're laying some groundwork so that we can move in that direction. And then, so the next phase, and this is where, this is kind of where Bakersfield College finds ourselves right now, is we really need to lean into assessment as a mechanism for making these badges really, really useful. So we're, st we're now that we've talked about skills and we've, we've <clears throat> used the SLOs and the objectives to generate that skills list, we're going to say, okay, folks, we're going to work with the assessment committee, develop a special program to pilot a skills-based, fully assessed, assessment-driven uh, teaching methodology across a few courses. And we'll use those courses as a model to say to the rest of the faculty, here's how you can do assessment for every SLO, for every student, for every course, every semester without killing yourself. And so that's the model that we'll be developing. Uh, we'll find some faculty champions and then we'll begin to disseminate that through the college. Shannon, question. Yeah, when I was looking at the badging structure, the, the three layers of badging that you showed are so, on, on the far right, did each badge represent a course SLO or a course? Uh, when, when I have the, let me just back it up to. Sorry. You're talking about this, this diagram? Yeah. Okay, so the, the far left where it says commercial music, that's a, that's a program level badge. Okay. And then we've got four courses for that program represented by the bright circular badges in the middle. And then you can see by the structure here that the B30 course, which is that top circle, has five SLOs. And those dark badges are the five SLOs for that course. Now, we have not implemented badges down to the SLO level yet. Instead, for B30, we have a course level badge that has skills that have been identified on the basis of the SLOs and the objectives of that course. Mm. Does that make sense? Okay. So uh, leaning into assessment, that's where we're at right now. And then the, the final word uh, is, is, the final piece of this is getting the word out. So we'll have to market this to our community, to businesses in the area, so they know that they can hire students using these badges. Um, we have to communicate it to our students so they know that they, what those badges mean that they're getting um, and how they can use those badges. Um, students are surprisingly astute when it comes to badging because guess what? They've been getting badges most of their life. Students of traditional college age have been have been have been familiar with badges if they've ever played a video game or or done a multitude of other uh, things in the electronic world because digital badges are everywhere in that world. So that's not a new thing for them. Yes, gamification. And in fact, uh, Jason, it's good that you brought that up because people say, well, I, I use badges in my course to help students progress or as a motivational tool. And I'm not saying we shouldn't use that, but I, I think there's a way to integrate those SLO level badges once we start getting down to that level in with those motivational or gamification type badges that, that are used for instruction. And that's sort of a whole nother topic, but very interesting as well. Um, we actually cover that in, in my games and learning class at Pepperdine in the doctoral program, uh, but it, it's, it, that's a, it's a great topic as well. And you know, the final piece of the communication that we need to master here is transfer institutions. We need to teach transfer institutions how they can look at our badges and use that high, high resolution image of those courses to determine transferability, articulation, that sort of thing. But it has, it has a, a, a possible, uh, absolutely Shannon, employers at the top of my list, um, you know, it has the, this has the potential by virtue of the richness of the information that's included um, to drastically accelerate a lot of these practices. Uh, because, you know, right now, if I'm a student and I'm transferring, I take my transcript to the registrar at the new institution. I say, here are the classes I took. And then they say, well, do you have a catalog description, right? That's the very first thing they say. I need more information. Well, if that information was embedded in the badge, it's just done. All right, so I, that's my last slide. Here's my information. Shannon, you have a question and I'm over time. I'm stealing from somebody else. I feel horrible. I just quickly, 
just is... just quickly, I wanted to to say that um, there there was a question earlier, way back in the chat about like what whether employers value these badges. And we we got the same question when we started rolling this out at Chafee. It's um, sim similar to what you have at Bakersfield, but eh, a little, little nuances here and there. But in any case, one of the things that I said to faculty was that validation or employer vetting of badges is kind of being built as we fly this plane, but also, it comes from you authenticating the skills in a meaningful way. Mm -hmm. it, it, if we wait for the badges to already be an acceptable thing by employers, then we won't ever get there, right? It'll just never happen. Where What we can do is build momentum behind it by uh, making sure that there's meaningful assessment and meaningful evidence of learning associated to what we do badge. Um, and as we accumulate that evidence over time, it does become valuable uh, to employers locally, even if it isn't valuable right here, right now, today. I wondered what your thoughts were on that. Yeah, it, it's sort of, it's a chicken and egg problem in a, in a sense. Um, Gosh, did I just lose it? Oh no, there we go. So it's sort of a chicken. Okay. It, cool. it it's a chicken and egg program uh, problem in some ways because employers won't value the badges until there are enough badges to have those things be on their radar from a hiring perspective. But in a lot of the digital world, if you go to LinkedIn, you can see that you can upload badges from your directly from your backpack into your profile, that sort of thing. <clears throat> Uh, if you go to NZ Skills Database, you can search directly on skills that are identified in your badges. So we're starting to see that awareness. But as we build institutional capacity with these badges, uh, we will see an increase in employer awareness. But it's sort of, it's going to be this thing where we do a little more badges and we, we do a little bit better instruction. Now the, the employers know a little bit more. It's going to, it's going to be a while. And that's why I keep stressing that this is not a revolution where one day we we all have badges and here we are and now we can get away get, get rid of grades and get rid of units and yeah it's going to be a long time of this parallel and my my dream is that over time the use people will see that the usefulness of of grades and units and some of those traditional measures it'll just trail off and then we can just say okay we're ready to just fly it fly with the badges and the skills and the and the mastery based learning and I think, Bill, you, you alluded to this earlier, the, the, the most important part of SLO is a student, student learning outcome. I think that badging and really focus on competency and skill attainment that, again, you've spoken about so much, is what makes a difference to the student. They are the ones who are going to be really ambassadors of our teaching. Because when they go and they talk to an employer, they are going to say, well, guess what? I can do this and this and this because they taught me. So whether we bring that, we empower them to the point that, you know, hey, take the transcript for us or take the badge from us or take us a certificate, a piece of paper. What's behind it is the story of student learning. And I think that ultimately is going to what's, what, what's, what's going to make a difference as long as the students can articulate what it is that they've learned. I think that you, you're absolutely right. It's not something that's going to, ha to happen overnight because again, our system of accountability is such that our students have to get a GPA out of our institutions. Who cares what they've learned, right, currently? Mm -hmm. Nobody pays attention to it. That's, that's the tragedy that, that, that you, again, you've articulated uh, more, more than enough. I, I think Enrique has one more question and then we do need to uh, move on to the next speaker, please. Uh, Derek, uh, Derek, you stole my thunder. I just like oh, to say that. Uh, it's, yeah, take more time out of my mouth. Sounds good. Thank you so much. Well, Bill, what can I say? Always a pleasure. Uh, thank you so much for for really for for sharing your expertise. And I tell you, chat is just absolutely exploding here. People are just saying great things about your presentation, your true inspiration. So again, we will make this recording uh, available. And and Bill is uh, you know Bill is at uh, 
uh, Bakersfield uh, City College, and, and, and he told me on Friday nights that all, all he does is he responds to emails from people from all over the world asking him questions about banking. So please don't hesitate to reach out to Bill. I'm sure he's going to entertain the discussion. Bill. I, I, would, I would love to hear from any of you. And if you're working on badging projects at your institution, I would, I would be happy to share resources or support or do whatever I can to support that. Because in, in, I think it, it's in my own best interest as somebody who wants to see this grow uh, to have as many schools doing this as possible. And we've got some tools that we'd be happy to share with you all. Um, and Yarek, I would I would love to uh, get a copy of the chat just so that I can follow up with anybody. Uh, we're on Canvas, uh, Jacqueline. Um, but it, it, if you can send me a copy of the chat when we're done, um, I would really appreciate it. Now I can I can go back and review uh, other questions or comments or whatever people yeah. had. But feel free to reach out to me. Could uh, you put your email in the chat? Sure will. Yeah, Thank you so much, Bill. Really appreciate it. Of course, we'll stay in touch. We are all here. So the community continues. So again, and Bill is certainly part of it. So don't hesitate to uh, send him an email. There he is. Uh, and now uh, let's move on. Amanda, if you could please introduce our follow-up speaker, I would certainly appreciate it. Thank you so much for, for making the arrangement. Yeah, uh, definitely. So one of the things that is so great about BSO Low Talks, and if you haven't had a chance to join us for multiple, is we love gathering all of these different ideas and different ways of assessment and getting our um, brains thinking of outside of the box um, that we haven't done before. And so to follow up, um, we have Yusuf is here from JobSpeaker and is going to present different ways to think about um, skill verification and skill assessment. So um, Yusuf, if you want to take it away, and Yark, you might need to give Yusuf screen sharing permission. I, I think, I think it's, it's, I mean, I, yeah, you certainly Are you able have. to, Yusuf? Yusuf, you okay? Uh, looks like I'm able to, so thank you. Well Please. set up. Uh, and Yusuf, you can give yourself an even better introduction if you would. Uh, I, I didn't read a bio. Just, just tell us who you are, please. I don't know if I can top that introduction. So hello, everybody. My name is Yusuf, and I work for uh, Job Speaker. Maybe some of you have heard of us. Uh, maybe not. We are in 60-plus colleges, in, uh, community colleges in California, including all of the colleges in the Central Valley, so from Stockton down to Bakersfield, the entire Inland Empire, the entire South Central Coast region, um, and then a lot of colleges up here in the Bay Area, where I am located from. I'm going to um, jump into the platform. I'm, not going to, I'm just going to show you live some tools that we um, we make available to students. So for background, <clears throat> JobSpeaker is a you know a three-party platform, which would be your students, um, yourselves as administrators, and then of course your employer partners in the in the community, who are welcome to have accounts and to come on and to post opportunities, interact with students, whether that's full-time work, part-time work work-based learning opportunities, so on and so forth. But today we're gonna to kind of focus on the student side. Please feel free to interrupt me and ask any questions. I am not as good as my uh, predecessor here in terms of monitoring the chat for questions at the same time, but I would like to, um, if you have a question, please feel free to interrupt me and make this interactive. And just thank you for having me today. I'm gonna to share my screen. Okay, everybody see my screen? Yep. Okay. So right now I'm in the student dashboard and this is my fake demo site and my mythical Faber College. So you'll see a lot of funny data in here. Don't, don't judge me or hold it against me, but I'm not going to, I'm gonna um, demo off of my demo environment. So one of the first things that we do when we work with an institution is that we go in and we attain your curriculum. Um, the, on all catalog information and, you know, and then all back end information. So anything in the catalog as well as your you know, your learning outcomes, your SLOs. And what we do is we take that and we scrape them down to a course level skill set. So every course will receive um, skill sets. We do this on a course by course basis because it's more granular and gives more accuracy. And also because we know that students take you know, non-traditional paths. And a lot of the time students change majors, but if you still completed six courses in a certain path or major, then you did attain some skills there. And that's gonna lend to your unique skill set. Um, so you can see here, this is my test student, Gary, and he's, you know, completed uh, or he's working on his degree for computer information systems. But, you know, Gary at some point took some cabinet making classes. So Gary, Gary at one point was involved in carpentry, right? And he completed those courses, lending to a unique skill set. And actually between computer information systems and carpentry, there is a nice CNC path you can get into, but we'll not nerd out on that now. It's just for 
example's sake. And what that does is it creates skills for Gary to see. This is Gary's skills transcript, right? This is his view. The skills in black are hard coded, meaning that Gary um, cannot change them. They're the ones that we derived from the curriculum and from all of the um, from all the programmatic data and curriculum data that we were we attained from the college. Um, and then the ones in green are those from from life, those that Gary brought along. We do, you know, we accomplish a lot of this more easily through integrations, although it's not necessary. So in this case, we, you know, we would be technically integrated not only, you know, for single sign-on purposes, but also into the student information system for transcript purposes. So if a student is to pass a class with satisfactory criteria, which can be up to you all, um, you know, whether that's a C or better or not, then the skills from those classes get verified. And in this case, you know, being a demo site, it's a very basic, um, very basic description of why it's verified or badged, so, so to speak. And this, you know, basically experientially giving you the idea in this case, it's just the course information. But there are other ways about it. Uh, we actually are able to do employer uh, verification, employer um, endorsements and verifications. So maybe the student picked up said skill on a work-based learning opportunity. Uh, and that may mean that the employer is endorsing yes. They have demonstrated that they did this successfully at our site so on and so forth. Does anybody have any questions around that thus far? Okay. And where this comes into play is in a few places. One is in profiles. Right? Students are able are encouraged to create as many profiles as they want, much like a targeted resume. Today, we're gonna to take a look at Gary's profile. <clears throat> From here, you can see Gary has the ability to present himself uh, to employers and, and, you know, and to those that he's willing to, you know, whether it's for a job opportunity or he's just looking for a way to share his uh, his information. So everything, you know, including social media all the way down to GitHub for those coding students for their code repository. Um, we can, you know, out embed outside portfolios, projects and badges. So whether they have their own website, their own YouTube channel or badges of some sort or a credential or a certification, um, those can be embedded in here and you know, interacted with, of course. And then here's where skills come into play. So again, we saw Gary's large skill transcript before. That doesn't mean that Gary has to attest to all of those skills. Also, a lot of those skills don't work in combination. So Gary is going to tailor his skill sets down and present the ones that he wants. The ones that he presents are what gives him visibility. So anything that you, you know, if, if it's not listed here, that doesn't mean the employer can search for it and reach out to him because Gary has not um, opted in to make that a visible skill. Uh, but that is something that's a feature as well. Employers can go in and search for people for students by skill sets and find students much like Gary and interact with them and see, you know, the details of why, where, how, and why he has said skill. Past that, it's um, you know experience in education, much like an online resume. And what's great about this is it can also be turned into a literal resume. I know that's you know it's just it's a student tool, of course, but they have the ability to print them out in many different formats, of course, which is then added automatically to their document library. Students are encouraged to upload as many documents as they want, whether that's resumes, cover letters, certifications, research papers, anything that they feel lends credence to their application package is kept in here in order for them to be able to, um, to use to apply to positions. Another way that um, skills come into play is that we have a job board. This is where your employer partners are able to post positions that they would like to advertise to your students. And I'm going to clear out all my filters and apply that just to give you the overall view. We have an on-campus flow. Many of our colleges use it to advertise the on-campus work, but also um, then there's the jobs posted directly by your students. <clears throat> As you can see here, um, this is posted by Faber College on Job Speaker, meaning that either an agent of the college or one of the employer partners of yours actually posted this directly. And the way that this works uniquely is that, you know, Gary has the ability to search for anything that he wants because um, it's open to do so. However, you're going to see jobs that are being driven towards him first and foremost, like such as network security specialist, admin assistant, laborer in this case, because Gary has those carpentry skills um, that are based on the skill sets. So to making sure that to, to focus on work for students that actually falls, you know, within their, their field of study to make sure they're getting a return on their investment and to make sure that your program is ensuring, you know, um, that students are getting jobs in their fields. Much like, I mean, I, um, Bill touched on earlier a lot of the times too, based on the, uh, the skills 
that we are able to uh, attain from a job posting. For example, if you were to click on a job posting, you can see that certain skills have been tagged. You're gonna get that skills gap analysis. So you're gonna find out what skills are wanted in the workforce, what skills students who have been successful in obtaining positions are bringing to the job, what was desired, and what skills have not been looked at at all, right? So if skills A, B, C, and D are being taught in class, but skills C, D, E, and F are being used in the workforce, then maybe A and B are a little dated and it's time to take a look at bringing in E and F. So if that makes um, sense. Going back to my dashboard, students are able to easily save their jobs, manage their jobs, and easily apply. Just by clicking one click apply, because a student has a profile built out, a resume uploaded and saved, in this case, a cover letter is necessary, they can even do an availability schedule. There's references. Again, this is my demo site, so every single bell and whistle is turned on here, but this is a customizable um, applications uh, and then submit, and that's it. And they can do this via mobile apps. So they can do it anywhere they want. As long as they've gone in, created an account, um, they're able to then um, apply to jobs on the fly anywhere they go. And your employer partner is able to easily um, just gather applications uh, and candidates uh, for students. Again, there are, is an admin aspect to this. So you all sitting in the middle have the ability to see um, and have over insight into all of these interactions and pull reports and pull you know the data that's necessary when it comes to the hiring aspects of your um, of your campus. Does anybody have any any questions around that? Uh, you said so. This is this may be somewhat a uh, simple question here, but would you please elaborate a little bit about the process? Where those competencies come from? How where do they originate, or how do you collaborate with colleges or or? Excellent. Who is sort of like, you know, influencing the, 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 the content. Excellent. So we have, when, when we, um, we attain the, your curriculum in a variety of ways, some colleges are able to, you know, um, export the different, you know, pieces of data necessary, because you know, obviously it's not all in one system, as we all know, but some colleges are able to attain that. Otherwise, we work with you in any way possible to get the full breadth of your um, curriculum data. Once we do that, we have, uh, we have, people on our team, we have um, curriculum folks who go in and take time to look through it all and hand scrapes of skills because we know that every program is different. That's why we take the, you know, the learning outcomes as well. Because you know, a welding program at College A is not the same as a welding program at College B, for example. Right. It needs to be, it needs to be specific to what the content of the courses and the program are. Once we do that and we create skill sets per course, we, we encourage um, the feedback. So we can take that and we can package it in, in um, whether you want it to be to an instructor level or, you know, a dean level of a program level or whomever. And we welcome the feedback that will then come in and we can, you know, tailor the skill sets around that, take in the feedback and find out what, you know, what we missed or in terms of um, verbiage or, or whatever that, you know, necessary in order to create an accurate um, skills profile for the college in all of their different programs and courses. If that answers your question, Mr. John. Yes, yes, I, I think it does. Uh, again, uh, there, there has to be some, some faculty work or, or you know, program administrators work uh, that, that would go into this. So I just, I just wanted to know how, how this uh, ultimately finds to your database so that again, students and faculty know, okay, faculty know how to align the instruction because this is what needs to be taught. This is what students need to be attending. This is how I'm going to assess this versus students who are on the receiving end realized oh well guess what as a result of this program now through job speaker portal i can apply for these jobs because i possess the skills right so so again i just wanted to understand better the process that 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 makes it all happen of course no that that's our major lifts so that's one of the core right. it's one of the core um, value props that we bring you know when we um start to work with the college that we you know the, the one of the main functions and one of the you know the the First things we really need to attain to do is to accomplish that uh, skills mapping on your curriculum, and that's that's one of our our main offerings, so to speak, and that's something that we take on as much as you know as we can. And you know, a lot of colleges do um, take the time to give the feedback and have their instructors do a review. Um, it's, you know, some it takes a little longer than others, but it's really completely it doesn't. It's not necessary that interaction, so to speak, because um, no matter what, the platform will function based on the skill sets that we derive. Uh, we've been doing this. We have 
you know, about 17,000 skills are a skills database now to inform us, you know, through AI and machine learning as well um, to inform us on, you know, um, you know, what we might have, have missed. Because like I said, we have a very tired curriculum team that goes through these things with a fine tooth comb, um, but they're very good at what they do. That so we definitely have built up the taxonomy to help us make more informed decisions and also to reveal sometimes, a lot, a lot of the times reveal skills to college that they have not um, portrayed yet to their students, so to speak. And if you were to perhaps uh, give us some examples, and again, this is not necessarily that you have to have it in your demo. Could you, would you be able to comment a little bit about the, this, again, the attainment of competency for, uh, let's say, focus areas or programs that are different from computers or, or you know, those that we uh, traditionally call skills-based programs. You know, this is our career education, right? Would you be able to talk about this a little bit about as to what other skills or, or sorry, sorry, maybe what other areas are in there above and beyond computers? Oh, of course. So our, an example. Uh -huh. Oh, no, of course. So I mean, I gave the example, you mean in terms of technical education? Yeah. So technical education is, I mean, is the, <clears throat> we came into the market um, five years ago and a lot of it was around strong workforce and right. that's that strong workforce alignment. Um, aligned directly with all CTE programs. So it's not just computers. I give computer examples because I'm a computer nerd. However, a lot of our a lot of our successes come from, you know, agriculture, mechanized agriculture, diesel mechanics, so on and so forth. And you know, um, informing students. Well, one, I mean, those are direct skill based um, programs, right? And informing students around their abilities to explore above and beyond, you know, just because you learned, you know, um, agricultural mechanics, that doesn't mean you need to find a necessarily traditional job that's an ag mechanic, you now have the ability to work on complex machines of different varieties and diesel and diesel, non diesel, what have you, and then be able to um, apply those to other positions that appear based on matching skill sets. So it works, I mean, it works in all aspects. We work with, you know, even those transfer programs, right? At least revealing students, skills to students that will allow them to find out, hey, you are, because there's also, um, you know, once you get deeper into the platform, maybe you majored in English and you plan to transfer, but with these, you know, 12 skills, you qualify for technical writing, which actually is a large, um, uh, has a large need, especially at the moment, um, based on your writing skills, if you were to brush up and even take these courses, not necessarily a program, all you need to do is finish a few courses, you would have the ability to, you know, make yourself a stronger technical writer. Um, that's one example. I gave the example of Gary here earlier, who is a, you know, in this, in this example, a computer science uh, major, but, you know, coming back from, or computer information systems major, but based on his background in what looked like carpentry and CNC, I mean, it makes him a, um, you know, a skilled machinist, uh, so to speak. So there are, um, and you know, a CNC programmer rather is what I'm trying to get at. So uh, does that answer your question, Mr. Johnny? Yes, yes, absolutely. That's it. That's exactly right. Because again, we we seem to, uh, again, this is something that, that that's uh, a, a backdrop for, for this discussion is is, is what, uh, what what's happening in our uh, academic circles, so to speak, discussions among faculty and their leaders is that uh, competency-based education or attainment of skill, well, yeah, that's good for career education. And you just told us that, hey, look at English, right? There is something like technical writing, this aspect of English, right? So again, that's a demonstration of the skill and competency that I think Bill uh, articulated quite, quite well. Uh, if you were to switch gears a little bit um, and, and tell us more about this, this alignment or what is the position of the job speaker between the college, the institution of higher learning, and the employer. Okay. How, how is how 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 do you make make it work? How what, what, are, the, what are the links exactly? Okay. And I'm going to intercede here before your Please. Yusuf goes off on that because I just wanted to tag on to what you were saying about um, we're talking about the GE classes and those skills. And I know on our campus, we're having a robust set of conversations with faculty in math, in English, in biology, in chemistry, right. in physics, about what are the specific skills that are present in your class and looking at mastery and verification of those skills. And so when we look at different technologies, such as JobSpeaker, that allows faculty to go in and say, here are the skills that my class is all about. So I've got these 24. 30, 40 different skills that all map up to my student learning outcomes. 
Now as a faculty, I can go in and say, hey, they've mastered 15 of these skills and be able to, to verify it in there. So it's a, it's a different way to look at the concept of when I'm badging and putting them all together and having it here. And it's the same thing of, you know, I'm going through and verifying those skills, whether we, we look at it in the different, um, whatever platform it is, it's I'm a faculty and saying, here are the skills I can say my, my students have mastered in my math class, my English class, my chemistry class, and my biology class as an instructor. And, and to what Bill was saying earlier, we can't pull apart instruction and assessment. They need to go all together. It's my role to provide you the support that you need to master these skills. But I'm also here to assess and say, yes, your skill mastery, I verified it. Sorry, I just wanted to put that in there. I didn't mean to, to detract you. Um, that, that, that's great. Thank you. Um, OK, so I'm just going back to Mr. Jenner. Thank you, Amanda, honestly. And but going back to uh, Mr. Jenner's question, uh, the, what we do is we we allow access, right? So we're a platform that sits in the middle. And like, as mentioned, there is three different parties, the students, staff and faculty, and the employers. Uh, we try to keep things as simple as possible on the employers, honestly, because employers have a job already. And the more that they have to do, the less we have found uh, adoption. However, employers are encouraged to come on to post positions. Uh, they can add skill sets to their positions or, or not. They can have skills suggested to them for their positions. Um, and then those those opportunities, whether that's a full time job, a part time job, a work based learning opportunity, whether it's an intern or an apprenticeship, can be presented to students for them to apply to. It allows employers to interact by you know event based um, activities, whether that's doing an events module. So if you're throwing a career fair, that's one thing, but it can also be a way for them to advertise other work based learning opportunities, the non traditional ones such as site visits and and so on and so forth, and you know speaking and whatnot. Um, it allows them to uh, also manage work-based learning. We have a full work-based learning module that um, keeps them, you know, that if they were to interact, it try, does everything down to timesheet tracking, objective setting, timesheet tracking, and evaluations. And it also produces a report that the employers can generate for themselves and help keep themselves uh, audit safe. Uh, employers have the ability to do a candidate search. So there's just a variety of ways for them to interact, but the name of the game on the employer side is more for you know, work-based learning, work experience opportunities, and of course, employment, um, and you know, making sure that your students are getting a return on their investment. Right on. And what about, what about the student roles? How, how do students take advantage of this setup? Because again, this is this is very clear to me. The skills lead to specific mm -hmm. uh, skills themselves, composition of skills, right? That students demonstrate lead to certain um, jobs, areas of interest, areas of focus. These are the things, you know, again, for, for students to pursue for their career or of education. Of How course. do students uh, use the, 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 the platform to put those pieces together for their own benefit, for the purposes of their own future? Of course. So that's, um, it's a long, it can be actually a long life cycle. So depending on when the students come in, um, we have, we now have, you know, a guided pathway, an assessment and guided pathways tool as well. So it depends. I mean, if you we work with K-12, so if your student is coming from a K-12 partner into the college, they can use it for, you know, career alignment and just a <laughs> career alignment from the beginning, right? Um, you have, might have a student that doesn't come onto the system until they're, you know, in their first or second year, in which case they're jumping into something that looks more like this, where they're gonna set up their profiles and start to get that career exploration that based on the skills that I'm attaining, it looks like I'm, you know, I could go in the X, Y, Z direction. And these are the opportunities that are being afforded to me. It's a communication tool as well. I mean, that way, this is a way for, you know, um, those people on campus who are responsible for uh, job development and employment opportunities to reach out to students, um, whether that's via, you know, just directly connecting them with employers or jobs or events, um, so on and so forth. Uh, it's a good tool for adult learners. We work with, you know, some adult learners as well when it comes to those who need to just upskill, uh, whether that's to, you know, get a promotion or to look for another position or to add to their repertoire because they know that they have reached a point in their career uh, arc that they want to, you know, either transition or, or use the skills that they have to um, move on to something bigger and better, so to speak. So there's a there's a that's a it's a long answer, Mr. John. Yeah, there's a lot of different ways for people to come onto the platform and utilize it. And what we like to say is that you know you don't need to learn, you know, you you know, 30% of the platform might pertain to you, and that's all you need to focus on. And you know, and that comes from all aspects, um, especially even as you know, staff and faculty and admins 
Uh, there might be tools that you don't need to use at all and just use the ones that create more efficiencies in your in your processes, so to speak. And um, yeah, so I'm not sure if that's a, a literal enough answer. Maybe that was more of a, a roundabout answer, but hopefully that makes sense. You, you, you're right. It's a it's a it's a it's a large area, but I'm trying to, you know, pick break it down a little bit. Right. So that we know we, we understand how you can how we can benefit for what it is that you that you provide. Uh, just by looking at the at the menu here, the skills and mentoring center. Um, what what right? What does what does mentoring mean in this context? Oh, uh, mentor center. Okay, that's another tool for the college. Uh, you can bring in your alumni. So maybe you have some alumni. And again, this is a very um, uh, rude example because this is there's not actual people, um, real alumni in here, but it's a place for a student to come in and say, you know, I really like some help with advice on career changes, and I'd be comfortable talking to somebody who was formerly a military veteran, um, and they can find your alumni who have opted in, created accounts, because it's an alumni outreach tool. So you find out the alumni are working, uh, you, they can be your employer partners, because of course they are the, you know, that's the best employer partner to have as a former alumni of the college, but students can come in here and say, you know, I'm looking for somebody to help me with information on this. They can find out more about them, the skills that they're also um, advertising that they um, use and then send a request to reach out to them and to get a mentor. And then the college is just facilitating that relationship, so to speak. So that's just another tool. Yes, we have a mentor center tool with many different tools in the platform. Yep. How, how about student orientation or counseling? Can can they take advantage of this mentoring center? I mean, I this is something that, you know, I, I, I tell you that we, we just don't do mentoring that way, right? In a sense that we normally as, as institutions, again, you can probably speak to your experience as you work with other institutions of higher learning, we normally don't rely on our alumni that way, right? We only, we, we kind of like, you know, hey, you, you graduate, we are going to reach out to you two years from now when you have enough money so that you can contribute to our foundation. And that's pretty much the end of the story. Uh, we, we just don't have it in the system to uh, call on those people to attest the value of our teaching and learning that's happening on our campuses. And I and and for that reason, I'm I'm just really impressed with the whole idea that, that you have it there. Oh. Would you be able to talk about the experience sure. from the counselor's perspective, or perhaps you know administrative leaders on campus? Sure. Uh, so the mentor center, and then you know to touch on that point, is a module that you know I have turned on right now because this is my demo site, but it's something we can turn on or off, and it's something that I would say. You know, it's something that is eventually gotten to because as you're, you're you know you're correct um then my experience as well the alumni piece has been in most colleges that we work at is somewhat you know overlooked um and it's just more of a fundraising idea uh, but the account you know it is a way it is a tool uh to reach out to alumni now whether you're going to do that for employment purposes to find out who's working because you want to get you know um, those strong workforce numbers for example and find out who's working where and then convert them into employer partners that's a very valuable tool i mean a lot of the employer partners in the platform are those um who you know formally um you know took a program at the college and in the mentor center it's just another um it's just another way to reach out you know, and counselors can most definitely, depending on who's responsible for that, you know, if, if anybody has that that task, but it's just a soft way to reach out and say, you know, we as an esteemed alumni of the college, um, you know, there are many people that uh, in your in your former program that would, you know, benefit from your your knowledge and expertise, and it's just a good give back to them. You know, we find that once the college has the bandwidth to tackle that task and to get to this part of the, the platform, uh, that you know, a lot of people like to do like to give back. So we do have a large number of alumni in the system. Um, it's just not something that you know. And I, it's uh, you know, uh, in my experience, I, we try to help as much as we can. But it is probably the most one of the most overlooked parts. And we just try to help make sure that it's an you know an easier connection. The alumni piece here being the mentorships, right? You bring in alumni as employers, we put them. You know, that's just you know more employers in your employer database that. You know, you have a warmer connection with and you can identify them as former alumni and so on and so forth. That's different. That's more on the admin side and an admin tool. Um, but if you want to bring them in as mentors as well, that's something that's very uh, easy to do. And then you're just facilitating the connection past that. There's not much to do with it. Uh, you, you can approve the alumni, right? You want to vet them to make sure they are indeed alumni before you start to connect them with students. Uh, you can either approve or just not have any insight or approval purposes into those connections or those relationships. And then once a relationship is forged, you know, you just have the um, the knowledge and the data that, you know, these two, these three, this you know, this alumni is connected with these three folks and so on and so forth. And it's just making sure that um, 
do students just have another line of support, so to speak? So just if, I, if I'm a, a faculty and I, I want to be able to say, I want to verify these skills that my students have done, how do I do that? How do you verify the skills? So that, that's, a very, that's a very good question. So there's a multiple ways. Um, if the college overall wants to set up a criteria that, you know, based on integration into your student information system, no matter what student information system that is, we've done it with a variety of them, that based on the transcript information coming back, anybody who passes with a C or <clears throat> C or better gets their skills verified. That's one way, <clears throat> but there's also the manual way. Instructors can go in and I'll give a quick example. Again, this is my demo site. It's not the best or cleanest example. I didn't wanna just go off a slide deck today. I wanted to show you all live because I hate to get bored with slide decks myself. Uh, we go in here, you can find a student, we're going to look at Gary. We're going to pick on Gary one more time. Here's Gary. Here's some information about him, his details, any tags that have been added, his profiles, all 50,000 of his resumes, because as you can tell, I use him for all of my examples, the coursework that he's in. And then if you wanted to do it in this manual way where the, um, the instructor came in and said all skills for um, this class here, we're going to verify and save that you know he has indeed passed his class satisfactorily. Now any any skill associated with that course is going to be checked off, but it can be done on a more granular level too. If you want to do so, it then I'm just going to pause you right here. So I'm the the economics instructor. I've already looked at all those skills and I've chosen them or verified them and said, um, yeah, all those economic skills are stuff that apply to my class. Gary's done them all. I'm going to check off that Gary's done it. And now when Gary goes to create his resume, Gary gets to say look at all these skills that I've done and put them over into his resume. That's exactly right. Okay. So if I want to do it manual and say, ah, you know what, I'm the economics instructor. Gary's done some of these skills, but not all of them. I want to be able to show and, and verify that Gary's done these skills. So he can put the ones he's done on his resume. He might not have even passed the class, but he's done some of these skills. And I'd like to be able to show employers that he's done that. How do I do that? Sure, that, that, that's something that's, uh, I don't have an example of here, uh, but that we can definitely get that in a more granular fashion where you can down, you can um, verify down to a, you know, a micro skill level, uh, so to speak, so, yeah. And so if if one of my skills, I, I, I can't even speak from economics, I was trying to do an example, but say in, I teach child development. And so one of those skills, what they had to do, uh, critically problem solve um, a caretaking emergency. And then I put that as my skill somehow. And so by verifying that, when my students go to the employer, I verified that skill. And that's one of the skills that they can put on their resume and say, hey, my instructor, this is verified by a class that I took. It's on my resume. My instructors verified that. Yes. Okay. Sorry, that was a long thing for you to say yes, but no, I, no. I was trying to give context in an no, instructional I was, to, I was trying to come up with you know, a more elaborate answer myself, but you know, the short answer is yes. <laughs> Enrique? Uh, yes, Joseph, how do you get, uh, you mentioned, you know, that, uh, I don't know, uh, the Walden program will be totally different from a Walden program at Sacramento Community College, right? And the skills might be different from, um, uh, say, uh, a, uh, an, ex an external accreditation. Um, and the outcomes might be different. How do you how do you, how, how does the Enrique attain the skills? Ah, okay, that's a very good question. So in this case, Enrique, uh, you would reach out to me and I would then package those skills and give them to you for that for any program that you wanted, which I can do because I work with Don at Fresno City College. All of your technical education programs are in the system. We fo focus primarily on technical education at Fresno City, but we work with all of the programs, honestly. Um, and we also work in the career center and so on and so forth. So um, if you, you know, how would you do it? I can give you, I can package it up in a way that you can then easily take a look and make the edits necessary. And then we reflect those. We put that, we re-ingest those into the system and make the changes on the back end. And then, and how does the student get, get involved? As far as, you know, Enrique is the student. I want to know what my skills are. I want to make sure that I, you know, when I do, uh, possess my degree and the employer, I'm sorry, the employer is looking at my skills that I have the skills. Oh, okay. So you, did you mean, I'm sorry, I don't think I understood your example. Did you mean as a, as a staff or faculty? 
as a student and as a faculty. I mean, you, you, I mean, you were showing that the, the faculty portion side, but as the student, I am, you know, Enrique is a student. I want to know if I have possessed all the skills. So what I was demoing earlier is the student side. What I just showed, right now, I just showed right now, checking off a class. That's the only thing I'm showing from the staff or faculty side. In which case, if you want to know on the back end what the entire skill set is for the welding program and and its, and its association with each course as staff or faculty, that's something that I would package and give. You know, we can take a look at on the side so we can reflect. As a student, students are not going to edit the overall programmatic data. What they do is they come in here and based on the program that they either declare right, manual, or in this case with student information system, which we are integrated at Fresno City, automatically their program is gonna show up with their actual list of courses because it's pulling from the student information system based on their program and the courses that they have listed, they're going to find out the skills that they're attaining in their skills transcripts. This is a student view. The skills from the courses that they have actually completed, that's the skills that are badged, so to speak, um, and verified. I, I didn't know we were using this. Now, are you is uh, CT? Are you focused more on CT? So yeah, I mean, primarily uh, it's it's been driven by the CT departments. I work okay. with Don and Becky um, um, a lot, um, but I mean, we have mapped the entire pattern. Thank you. And, and with that integration and also I'm going to tie it back to the work-based learning like Yark was saying that something that's growing so strongly on our campuses where we have got work-based learning applied learning competency-based education um, and one thing that can be missing is so as an instructor I verified these skills but I also want other employers if I have my students going out and demonstrating these skills whether it's in an apprenticeship program or what we're doing in our social sciences now is doing work-based learning in that so we've got our um, journalism students going out and actually creating a paper and doing all that. So how how can a student be able to prove that they have those skills? What would what does that look like? What does the employer get to do to verify those skills as well? Let me rephrase my my question. So if, if you want it to be um, verified on the employer side, then you know between you know, interaction and communication it has to be it has to be a, a participating employer partner right but they can go in and they can say based off this experience you know i'm going to verify this this skill for gary or these these few skills for gary um i believe the first and that's just going to just appear in the same way and again this i don't have you know this is a demo site so all of the criteria and attestments that you're seeing is just based off of we just took the um the fake catalog information, but this could say employer verified or employer endorsed and have the information around the employer or, you know, the opportunity around it. Um, the first part of your question was, is how does the student represent? Uh, I, that was basically my roundabout way to get to what you just answered. <laughs> Too many words um, to get so, to ask one question. So as a student, I've had a skill, I'm taking an English journalism class. My instructor has said, yes, they can, publish an article using whatever criteria, whatever skill it might be, they've gone out and applied that work in a, a newspaper. And that employer can also say, yeah, I verified that skill too. So now a student has that skill verified, not just from the class they took, but that's, also in that applied learning context. So that's they what have those call, skills verified. That's what we call the experiential endorsement, right? So mm -hmm. it's the experiential endorsement as opposed to the um, the, the, the institution-based endorsement. And that's just the way we refer to things um, on our end. But yeah, that is that is, is exactly right. Okay. So I think all this goes back to, right, all those all those points about the utility of it, you know, again, for students, right? And and not only in career education, but in other, other programs as well. I think that's that's what we're after. Um, again, we, we are having all those conversations focused on career education. We would like to make sure that you know, students are learning in, in math, in philosophy, in psychology, in geography, you know, all those, all those areas. We would like to make sure that they're, they find their uh, niche to uh, attest to the fact that they've heard, have attained skills in, in, in other areas. So this certainly looks, you know, very, very promising as far as, as, far as I can tell. <clears throat> you have shown us, right, my jobs, how, how students um, identify their, their career path if you do, do you have something similar? Would you be able to 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 tell us 
if uh, a job speaker helps students move on their uh, move move on into their further academic careers, so that they know that they are you know learning something, they are ready for something else that perhaps at community college will will put them at certain level. But now there is a BA, there is a master's degree, oh, yes. you know, further education somewhere else, so that they. You know, so they, they see that there is options, right? Rather than just, you know, I'm locked down to this certificate and now, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm done kind of a thing. Yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a few ways. Well, we, we have a separate program. It's a separate, you know, uh -huh. separate um, product that actually does help with that in terms of pathway um, and just, you know, progressing through in, the, in the career, their career life cycle. Um, simple tools that we have within the platform is, for example, we have UXplore, where a student can enter in a, a job, a field, a program, or even a skill, right? So I can say, you know, what do I want to do with my jQuery skills, for example? Uh, and it's going to give them um, uh, labor market information based on, you know, the top. So that jQuery skill matched up to these three top positions right now. This could be opposite. It could be based off of, you know, field or, or area of interest. But just to give an idea of the immediate tool that students have, they do have this labor market information available to them where they can see it, whether it's country or they can whittle it down to their actual area. So my fake student lives in Compton, so it would show, um, you know, the area in LA, but they can get the idea of, you know, whether not just salary information, but also the requested experience, the requested education, top employers, skills um, that they might need to upskill in order to based on different levels, certifications they want to go for. And there are ways that we tie in where actually um, it can, you know, in our other in our other product, it has all of this, but then it would also tell you and direct you to if you want this certification or if you're going to move on to this program, this would be the college to go to if it's going to be done on a regional level, or this is the these are, these are the courses at the college that you're in that can actually give you those skills in order to upskill and get to that uh, to that place. And that's a different product. I don't have a demo for that right now, but that's a very um, it's a very good question, Mr. Jenner. Yeah, no, no, not a problem. I completely understand it. This, this, this makes a lot of sense. Yeah, the top employers, the location, the, uh, mm -hmm. the options are available. Super. Well, hey, what can I say? Great. Enrique just attested. You know, you, you can talk to about this, Enrique, because that's that's fascinating to me, right? That, that there's, you know, there is a specific uh, job skills related program, and you don't even know that it exists on your campus, even though you're the SLO coordinator. That that just tells you about the gap, you know, but between the uh, accountability driven SLO assessment and you know what the creditor creditors uh, make us do versus what actually happens on campus there's just just like dual reality going on I suppose that is really fascinating to me well so Enrique, I, put my, I put my email in the chat if you'd like to connect please reach out and send me your contact information and I will we can connect and discuss and I can get you up and running you're eligible for an account all of that I mean you have a full license at Fresno City College so I can get you on there if you would like Thank you. Uh, Jerry, you just made my point. Uh, it's mind-boggling, right? Right, 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 right. Yeah, that's, that's, that's why we are having these conversations here, you yeah. know, because there isn't really any other place to, to express those, those thoughts. Sounds good then. Well, thank you so much, Joseph. Really, really pleasure. Great, 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 great uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Alrighty then. So um, we are going to make the, the um, uh, recording available. Any, any more questions, comments, final thoughts? Uh, Jacqueline, how, how is it going on your end? Is, is everything okay? Do you feel inspired again? <laughs> just, just, just checking on you. I, I feel so, so, so inspired. I, um, this, this, oh, I cannot tell you how much value these sessions are every single session Excellent. I walk away with something different to try the big take-home message for me today is um came from very early in Bill's presentation mm -hmm. that are we sharing with the students their progression on the objectives right. and that applies not only to the professional um accreditation outcomes, not just those, but even the course level and just how inadequate a grade is at getting that information across to them. So I'm just 
my head is just spinning with possibilities from both our presenters this morning. I'm a little overwhelmed about how to accomplish it in a systematic way. But as Bill was saying, you just start at the course level. And man, it just smacked me right in the face, the course that I'm treating right now. I just had the students do an assignment on the social determinants of health. And it occurs to me that that assignment was entirely at C1 and C2 and not at the level of application or um, synthesis. And so it's, it's really not an adequate assessment. And I'm going, oh my God, I thought this was such a good assignment. Right. So it really makes us step back and think. A great presentation. Right, right, right. Absolutely. Isn't it interesting? All of a sudden, we start paying attention to what students learn and look at our universe. You know, it's practically shattered. Right, right. Thank you so much. Right. So I had the, the lovely idea that wouldn't it be nice to provide the students with a silver, bronze, or gold medal of their achievement toward the outcomes? And then I was going, okay, so based on the work they've done in class right now, I have this assignment would not even be on that scale. So why am I having them do that right. assignment? And it was such a good assignment. Right, right, uh, right. So, so yeah, true. so I guess we never quit growing, right? That's right, that's right, that's right. And, and, I had a lot of those moments when I mapped all of my skills and my outcomes and then which assessments, assignments I was using to do that. And there were, there were a few that it was, your face it just did everything is, but, but I love that assignment. It's, right, it's a great assignment, right. but it wasn't useful in this class for those skills. And, right. and it was, it was such a hard thing to let go of. So I, I wow. empathize with that um, epiphany because it, 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 it's exactly what happened to me. It's, I really want them to do this, but, but why it's not an outcome, a skill in this course. It's just extra work. Um, right. That's beautiful, but my course is about these skills. I, I've told my students that they're these skills, so I, I feel I feel yeah. Yeah, thank you. Fascinating. Thank you. Thank you both. Yes, very powerful, Amanda, Jacqueline. Thank you for the inspiration. Uh, Michelle Dunbar from Dominguez Hills, how are you? I see you're going. To, you're, you're you're having some conversation about uh, collaboration here, so that's that's always good. Good to see. Yes, you. thank you. Thank you. Fantastic. All. Looking forward to it. I'm glad. I'm, I'm I'm hoping this is you know we are going to create more of those circles. So thank you very much. Um, right on. Well, we are almost out of time. So if anyone has any final thoughts, comments, questions, please don't hesitate to 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 let me know. Uh, please be on the on the lookout with the listserv. If you don't, if you don't, if you're not part of it, then send us an email. Let us know that, that you're interested 